So my name is Austin. We're here at Hartfield and Company. Hartfield and Company was started in 2014. When we opened our doors in 2014, we became the first and only legal production of alcohol in Bourbon County since 1919. So a big thing for us is we're bringing bourbon back to Bourbon County. It's kind of our tagline. It's our slogan. We started when Jeremy Buchanan, the owner and CEO of Master Distiller, he started it with his brother in 2014. And they said, what happened to all the bourbon from Bourbon County? And what happened was prohibition was enacted. Prior to prohibition, there were about 26 distilleries that were operating inside of Bourbon County. Overnight, all of those shut down and none of them reopened. Big reason for that was the Bible Belt. Not a lot of people wanted alcohol here. The joke was up until about 15 years ago, I think, I believe Bourbon County was a dry county. And the joke was you went to Christian County to get your alcohol. So uh, fun little, little, little joke on that one. Uh, but our owner, Jeremy, he said, let's bring bourbon back to Bourbon County and let's do it the old fashioned way and kind of bring those methods that the Scottish and Irish who settled this area uh, were known for doing. So single batch distilling is a big thing about us. What we get off our still one time is what we get. We don't double batch distill where we're gonna increase the quantity. We want to remain and have a quality spirit. And then we're gonna use high malted barley content. Uh, high malt historically is what they used. Reason for that was uh, kind of a jokingly way to put it is uh, back in the day, the yeast strands were no different than grandma sourdough bread starter. So you take a loaf of that, pop it in there and you use higher malted barley content to aid in the fermentation process, drawing more sugar out of the corn. Uh, I'll get into that here in a minute. And then a uh, big thing about us also is we're gonna age in six gallon barrels. So we do six gallon barrels, 30 gallons and 53s. And six gallons were kind of a historical thing uh, that we kind of uh, brought back and kind of revitalized. Two reasons for it. One, the history aspect. Two, when we started in 2014, we were down in a much smaller building on Main Street and moving six gallon barrels up a small stairwell was a lot easier than 53 gallon barrels that were 500 pounds. So it was kind of a, out of necessity for that and then still kind of maintaining that old way of doing things. So historically, uh, the old way of doing it was small six gallon barrels because that's what they had. Uh, they were using it for flat boats that would kind of ride up from the port of New Orleans on our old Bourbon County uh, box. We kind of have a picture of a flat boat fella right there that you can take a look at. Uh, and so flat boats, uh, what they were doing was they were coming up from the port of New Orleans and trading with the locals. The locals just happened to be the Scotch-Irish. Uh, Post-Revolutionary War, if you fought in the war, you got a parcel of land. If you grew anything on that land, you got to keep it. So ideally, you grew corn because corn grew exceptionally well in this area. And if the government came to say, hey, uh, we want the land back, ideally you could say, hey, I grew stuff on this. It's mine now. Uh, and so corn, liquor was pretty much it, 100% corn. Uh, and then they were starting to trade with others around the area, getting a little wheat, getting a little rye, getting whatever other things that they could get. Nobody really wrote anything down over 100 years ago. Like they're not keeping it like records like they are today. And so it might be, hey, we got 100 pounds of corn, 10 pounds of wheat, mix it, whatever the uh, ingredients were at the time. And so these flat boats would come up and they would trade with the locals for the goods that were inside of their barrels for uh, the whiskey that the locals were making. They would make that journey back down to the port in New Orleans where they found that those barrels aged much quicker. So everybody's kind of familiar with some instance of the story. And really it was about an eighth to 10 month journey that they would ride those rivers back down where they would age much quicker. So due to the surface area contact in a smaller barrel, it'll age much quicker. So we do 12 months in a six gallon barrel. That is roughly the equivalent of four years in a 53 due to surface area contact. And because we do single batch distilling, that's what's gonna allow us to have a good natural flavor as the finished product, which when he gets to try it, hopefully he'll relay that very well to you guys. So super excited about that, uh, bringing bourbon back to Bourbon County. Uh, fun little fact of where the word bourbon comes from. Are you familiar, do you know where it comes from? Oh. Bourbon, the French house of Bourbon. It was a French dynasty, uh, kind of like a royal family, the best way I can describe it. And uh, a lot of French influence in Kentucky after the revolution. They just started naming things around Kentucky, uh, French names as a nod to the French military who helped us win. So drive around for five minutes inside of Kentucky, 
you're going to see French sounding names and it is linked to some sort of military advisor or French military family of some sort uh, that's linked in that way. So here in Bourbon County is named after the French House of Bourbon. Fayette County is named after Lafayette. And then Paris here is named after Paris, France. Uh, so kind of inversely on that, then the port of New Orleans, they would take those six gallon barrels and they would trade them uh, to bars and taverns locally. So there, those guys would take them and they would just put a, a, a spout in it or tap the barrels and you would just drink straight from it. You'd carry around your own bottle. So mass production of bottling wasn't really a thing until the later 1800s. Prior to that, you carried around your own bottle, your own jug uh, with triple X written on the front of it or something like that. And so you'd go into a bar, you'd say, hey, I want whiskey. And ideally they'd say, where from? And you'd say, I'd like whiskey from Kentucky. And then they would say Kentucky Corners over there. And on the front of the barrels would be stamped what county, what state, and who made it. So if you think about it, it would say Bourbon County, Kentucky, and we'll say Hartfield family was the one who was making it. And then so you'd say, oh, I'll take that Bourbon County whiskey to where people started loving it so much that it became colloquially slang all over to say, I want bourbon to denote what whiskey from Kentucky that you wanted. And then this area of uh, Bourbon County as we know it today was becoming known as Old Bourbon County. So it was originally a lot larger uh, county as a whole. It was about 38 counties made up of uh, back then that are now of today. And so they started breaking off. And as it was breaking off and becoming smaller and smaller counties, where we're at today of Bourbon County was known as Old Bourbon County. So this was where kind of the best stuff was being made. It was also where everybody was bringing their whiskey from around to trade at Stoner Creek, which is uh, behind us. So if you go right there, there's some train tracks and on the other side of the train tracks is Stoner Creek. And Stoner Creek was kind of the, the hub area where people were doing their trading. Little history of that. So we'll go look at our Rick House, check out our mash tons, and then we'll come back down here and I'll explain this bit. So this is our Rick House. This is where everything ages. Uh, our lick, Ricks are a little bit bare. Uh, we just did a 37 barrel pull today, this morning, and last week we did about a 30 barrel pull. So the reason why it's looking a little, little bare is because of that, which is a good thing for us. It means our stuff's aging out, ready to get out there. That's what we're super excited about. So when it comes up here, we've got six gallon barrels, 30s on the floor, and 53s over here. So six gallons will age for 12 months. 30 gallons are gonna age for a minimum of two years. When it hits two years, it gets straight bourbon whiskey title. We're in Kentucky, so it's called Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey. So two years minimum on the 30 gallons, and then our 53s have a minimum of four years. So ideally, we wanna to get to the point where we're gonna be aging them longer, uh, but where we're at in the bourbon world and getting product out, four years is kind of the sweet spot that we're hitting. Also with single batch distilling, we're gonna have more natural flavor inside of that barrel. Uh, so we don't need to hit that six year mark just to get some flavor. We are not refining ethanol uh, like some other places might be that need that time in the barrel. So once it comes up here, it's just gonna sit. If you think of other Rick houses that have barn style or tall five to seven, however many tall style stories, the top floor is gonna age faster than the bottom floor. Everybody calls the middle one the sweet spots. And so for us, uh, we don't need to move things around. For other places, they're gonna need to rotate those barrels on whatever determined time that they, time frame that they see. I'm not sure, but what I've heard is generally about a year and a half to two years. Uh, if you're trying to get eight to 10 years on an age cycle, you're gonna wanna move those barrels around to get them time uh, in the sweet spot and in those hotter and colder climates. So up here, everything ages, as you can see probably from the sweat on my brow, this building is very old, there's no central air, uh, so it's quite warm up here at all times. When it gets into the winter, it's gonna get quite cold. So we've got the train coming through. I'll, I'll let it go for a second. It's <laughs> just part of the flavor of the, flavor of the city. So it's Kentucky, exactly right. Uh, so uh, when it comes up here, it's gonna age. We get hot and we get cold. So when it's sitting up here in the heat, it's expanding. The, the barrel's gonna swell a little bit, filling those cracks and crevices with the distillate. When it gets cold, it's gonna shrink on itself, getting that distillate time to get on itself, developing those flavors. So 
more oak flavors it's gonna get, more of those sugars it's gonna uh, bring out in the flavor and the darker color it's gonna get, more time it sits on itself, it's gonna develop, develop the kind of the sweeter citrusy notes and some uh, lighter notes that you'll get off bourbon. So you want seasons on the barrel as an age uh, and up here, it's gonna get all of those seasons. So summertime, uh, we're probably sitting around 88 to 90 something degrees. It'll get up to about 110 up here sometimes. Winter time, it won't get below freezing, but it'll sit right there at 36, 35 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for, uh, he'll have to do the, the, the conversion <laughs> for, for our European friends. But when it gets up here, we'll just bring it up and we'll just let it sit. So a neat little history of this building is uh, this was originally a grain factory made in 1911 for all of the distilleries in Bourbon County. Prior or post, uh, pardon me, post 1919 when Prohibition was enacted, it gave up the ghost not too long after that since bourbon was kind of the big thing around here. So it kind of went by the wayside that in 1925 uh, it became a Chevy car dealership. And so this area where we're standing right now is actually where they stored the cars. Uh, the second floor that we'll kind of go take another uh, better look at was where they uh, worked on the cars. It was the mechanic shop. And then the first floor was the showroom. So all of it was done by this grain elevator right here. Uh, we'll have a bit safer look at it on the second floor that we'll go look at. But this is how we move all of our grain up and all of our barrels up and down. And like I said, the barrels come up here and they'll sit. We don't have to rotate. We don't have to do anything uh, for that. Any questions on aging? Perfect, they come up, they sit. Most all of these barrels are from Avon, Minnesota. Uh, they were one of the places that were selling to us during the barrel shortage uh, of COVID. So that was kind of a, uh, a no brainer for us to get some barrels. Those eight over there that look really old and dusty are our oldest barrels. We're in our 10 year anniversary right now. We're gonna be celebrating our 10 year anniversary sometime in September or October. Uh, I'm not too sure yet but we're gonna be pulling those barrels in time for that. We're gonna be having our nine-year-old barrel out there uh, doing the uh, uh, bottles that we've got. So a pretty cool new line coming out from it. Any questions from you? Cool, we'll head over here. Here's our mash tons in our grain area. So our mash tons, they're not anything in particularly special. Uh, they're just repurposed uh, drill press motors with fan blades on them. Uh, they're uh, big totes, that's what they are. So open top, uh, what we're gonna do is fill them with 2,000 pounds of 185 degree water. We use flashpoint boilers uh, behind it, uh, those three machines over there. And uh, uh, what we're doing from there is heating them up. 170 to 185 is the ideal temperature to add corn to. Uh, 175 to 185, pardon me. When corn gets heated up, it's gonna release its natural sugar starch and what's gonna happen is uh, that is going to aid in the long format of fermenting uh, by adding malted barley onto it. So when I get a, outside? what's that? Your mill is outside? No, we get it shipped to us okay. from Highlander Feed and it comes uh, milled already. So uh, this comes from them, Good. Gotcha. Uh, all of it. So this is corn, uh, this is our rye right here. Excellent, thank you. Mm -hmm and then uh, malted barley uh, right here. So this is our two row malted barley that we use for a pre-prohibition style mash bill. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, what I'm gonna do in the morning is do our two primary grains first, corn and rye or corn and wheat, just depending on the mash bill. I'm gonna toss them in there first by hand using the bucket. I'm the guy who does all that. I'm the masher and the fermenter here. Uh, no previous real experience on that just learning as we go. But I take that bucket, scoop it by hand, fill up each one. We're gonna do anywhere between 12 to 1400 pounds of grain a day for, uh, between the two. So in total with both of those machines, by they're done, we'll be somewhere uh, in there from the grain. And I'm gonna let them sit till they get to the internal temperature of 155 degrees. So for this instance, corn and rye, let them sit. When it gets to 155, I can add my malted barley into it. So then I'll add malted barley. The reason for that is you don't want to recook your malted barley. Uh, it can give you stringent flavors. It can change off the entire pH. A lot of things that can happen. Just don't do it. Just wait till it hits the 155. Um, easiest way to do it. Once it hits that, I can add in the poundage, uh, whatever the poundage is gonna be per mash bill. 
Uh, and so grab the, uh, grab the uh, bag, however much of it is that it needs, and it goes in there. Malted barley has uh, an enzyme in it called amylase. Amylase is also what's in your saliva, uh, if you've never known that. Whenever you eat something sweet and your mouth waters, uh, that is your saliva using amylase to break down those complex carbohydrates and starches to turn it into sugar inside of your mouth. In the same way, when I add malted barley onto corn, it is breaking down the starch, giving us refined sugar, so that when I add yeast onto that, it gives us a ferment, which is gonna be the yeast eating the sugar and giving us alcohol being created through the carbon dioxide. Do you add any enzymes? We don't. All of it just is gonna come naturally from... What is your mash bill? Uh, is that secret? No, it's not secret. Um, so our pre-prohibition style is going to be 62% uh, corn, 19% rye, 19% malted barley. And then our pre-prohibition weeded is 80% corn, 20% malted barley. And we've played around with a couple of, uh, um, of the old Bourbon County, but it's either going to be 72% corn, 20% wheat, and 8% uh, malted barley, or 70% corn, 20% wheat, 10% malted barley. Um, so we, we've, we've messed around with those in our experimental side, uh, and both of them are really good, but we've been, we've been rolling with 72, 20, and 8, uh, but we've got some 70, 20, 10 um, that may or may not be used. Uh, that one, you leave it, take it or leave it, edit that out. I, I'm not too sure that's a, a future thing that we've got to work on, but um, our bash bills, we're not keeping them a secret. It's just whether or not what we roll with. Uh, on that, but uh, nope. Uh, firm Solutions uh, out of Danville, Kentucky. Uh, we'll use them, and if we, if we, <laughs> what's that? Dr. Pat Heise. Dr. Pat Heise. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, oh, really? Right on. Very cool. Uh, and then if we can't get a hold of them, or uh, just for the yeah, 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 just for that. Uh, um, and if uh, we can't get a hold of them, we've used Red Star yeast off of Amazon, just a distiller's yeast. But uh, South Fork. Uh, malt house, uh, which is where we get it. Oh, sorry there, Rye. That's Rye, uh, the Rick House manager. Um, but South Fork Malt House is a guy out of Cynthia, Kentucky. His name's R.T. Case, and he's pretty much a one-man show. I think he has one or two people helping him when they can, and he's producing some really good stuff. Uh, some higher-ups were uh, able, some people in the bourbon world were able to take some uh, samples of it and they said this guy's producing some of the best stuff so we feel pretty fortunate and blessed to have RT on our side and all of our grain comes from Highlander uh, and it's from local surrounding counties all the counties they get it from touch um, so I call it the bourbon cartel they get all those grains together and bring them to us and supply some other bourbon places Excellent. yeah and you firm it down below or yep we're gonna go take a look right at it uh, neat thing about us is we're gravity it's the old-school way Sir Isaac Newton invented gravity specifically for bourbon don't fact check me on that, just trust me. Uh, and so we've got that hose over here, and this hose is gonna go straight through the floor uh, through just a hole in it, and I'm just gonna plug it up to the front, open the valve, and let it flow straight down from there, and it's gonna go right into our fermenters. So here is all of our stuff uh, made, ready to go, ready to ship out, um, cased up. It'll just sit here till it gets bought. Here's Waylon Jennings. Um, the uh, bottle manager uh, for that keeps the mice away but from here it's just going to come in here put on a pallet when it's all labeled cased up ready to go and just sit till our uh, distributor comes fix it up or we sell it to you over the counter uh, over here more stuff bottles to be used uh, more stuff cased up ready to sell uh, we have our fermenters going right here let me turn this off We've got our fermenters going right here. Um, so we've got three going. Um, th I always, so if I say three, it's really six, but in my mind, this is one run. Right. So two upstairs, uh, those two mash tons, will fill these two firm tanks, one and one. Uh, and then these will go into the still and fill the still. So in my mind, this is one run. Um, so time, three days? Five days. Okay. We do five days. Um, so if you want to come look, uh, right here, you can get some videos. This is uh, started uh, of uh, the 14th. Mm -hmm. This was done yesterday, 15th, so Thursday. And then this one was done Tuesday, uh, the 13th. Get this.
Yeah, it's gonna be coming soon. And then so what I'm doing here is kind of show uh, air is gonna go to them. We're gonna cool them down to 95 degrees. Hey, you do a whirlpool. It's just like a yep, it's seat. just, uh, it's just compressed before. air being pushed through it. Right. Um, so we're gonna be using these red and blue hoses. Right. Uh, blue is cold water. Mm -hmm. uh, if I've got a better look at it over, let's see. Now nah, we moved them. Uh, inside is just copper worm uh, pushing cold water in, uh, pulling hot water out. So cold water goes in, hot water gets pulled out, and uh, we're going to use compressed air to start cooling it down. We cool it to 95 degrees. That's the ideal temperature for us to add yeast to it because it keeps it within a 9 to 5 workday. So we could, you know, 85 to 95 is good range to add it. Uh, anything below 70 can be too cold and you can risk it falling asleep. But anything over 100, you can risk cooking it and losing it. So 95 just keeps it in a regular work day um, so that I'm not here till like 8 p.m. on, on hot days. Uh, and that's what we're going to do, just cool it down, compressed air, pushing through cold water going into it. Uh, and then when it cools down, pitch our yeast into it, let it sit for those five days. And then I'm going to take uh, measurements uh, each day. So uh, temperature, gravity, and pH. So uh, all of them are going to have temperature. Gravity is the projected yield of alcohol that's being created. Uh, so I want to see the numbers start high and end low. I haven't done it for today. Uh, I'll be doing that a little bit later. And all that's doing is we're going to put those numbers into a computer. Computer's going to spit back out and say you've created X amount of alcohol. So right now this is called distiller's beer, kind of uh, uh, colloquially or in the biz kind of known. Uh, because there's no difference at this moment between beer and whiskey. So beer is going to be boiled, whiskey will be distilled. So we're capturing the alcohol vapor that's being created uh, to make whiskey, whereas beer you'll just boil it and separate the, um, the ingredients from that way. And so uh, pH, uh, the other thing is the natural acidity that occurs inside of it. We don't do anything to adjust any of these things. Once it goes in here, once we pitch our yeast in, we just let it sit and then we'll add cooling to it if it needs it. That's why that fan over there was going, just to kind of keep it in uh, from getting up above 100. We just let it sit for those five days. Fifth day, we've opened up the valves on the front and just let it flow straight down. Okay. Now, uh, would this be considered a, a sweet mash process? Then? We are a sweet mash, yeah. Okay. So we start fresh yeast every time. Oh. Yep. And okay. so. No wash, uh, setback. Nope, no setback. Okay. Uh, this machine right here is our LSS machine. Uh, normally there's a giant tote underneath and then that tote is going to get the spit grain and the spit grain is just going to go to a local farmer. He's actually coming in the next like hour or so to pick up uh, the spit grain and he's going to give it to his cows, chickens, all the barnyard animals. Uh, and uh, what that's going to do is just give us wort so we're grain out yep. fermentation, sweet mash, and we don't do anything to backset it. Pardon me. Or anything like that. We just... I was just liquid solid separator. That's why that's your basically your lauter. You you lauter with that. You separate. Yeah, it's like a giant wire brush that's going to okay. be spitting that grain out. Okay. Yep. So you don't you don't distill on grain. Nope. Nope. Okay. We have a few um, experimental right. stuff that we messed around with. Uh, for us, it's a unique flavor enough because we've been doing um, grain out this entire time for, since the beginning, uh, and so we messed around with it. And it's a unique enough flavor, but it's not the same to where it's like, oh, we could just go into that. So we probably won't do it, but we've got, I think, I don't even know how many, maybe 10 barrels of experimental stuff. But we, being that we use those small barrels, we also get to play around with stuff. So it allows us to know within that eight to 10 month range, hey, this is something good. Make this mash bill into larger products and to put it a single barrel or something like that. Or it's like, hey, this was good. It was a fun experiment we did. Let's Release it under the experimental okay. line. Now, um, I've never seen anyone do the air bubbling before. Okay. Is that your own idea, or where did that come from? I'm not too, too sure on that one. It was mostly a thing of uh, when you add yeast to it, what we're going to do is uh, pull out about seven cups worth, mm -hmm. uh, put the yeast in there, let it mix for 30 minutes right. or sit, and then that's kind of a jump start. We call them yeast bombs. Right. Uh, and then putting air into it allows it to be right. moving all around uh, and kind of getting... Uh, getting. So you have no circulation, you don't have a blade in there turning? Nope, nope, just, just sits. It's, it's, it's a it's PEX tube like you yeah. see up here. 
uh, and it just sits down at the bottom, and we drilled little holes in it. Very ingenious. Love it. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's one of those, uh, we call it, you know, the, the redneck science behind some things. <laughs> you MacGyvered it. Yeah, MacGyvered it. That's exactly <laughs> right. You know, we're, we're making things work. Uh, we don't all, any of us really have a background in this stuff. Um, so we're, we're learning. Uh, I'm learning. I've been here for almost two years. So I'm learning uh, from what they've learned and from what they know. And we're all just, you know, learning together. Uh, but hopefully, have you had our stuff before? Sorry, I'm excited. I understand. I, know. <laughs> I understand. Um, I change that one day. Hey, together. if you're the guy, you're the guy. You're the yeah. guy. I'll make sure that that card gets to um, the chief. Any questions? No. Cool. Fifth day, we just open up the valves on the front and let it flow straight down into our still, right. which we'll go look at. So here, this is our um, uh, bottling and labeling plant. Uh, best way to describe it, jokingly, affectionately calling it that. What's going to happen is we've got a giant tote of alcohol right here. If you want to come over here, uh, you can get a look. Uh, that has uh, our uh, HNC1, uh, which is our uh, pre-prohibition Kentucky bourbon whiskey in it and uh hose is going to go inside of it four bottles will be put up hit start <laughs> fills the four bottles every bottle is going to be hand filled hand corked uh and then the anti-tamper device will be put on top of it this black label uh all by hand somebody here there's only five of us who work uh one to two of us may be working up in here at a given time sometimes it might just be one of us and uh you know it's not uncommon to see even the boss coming out here taking phone calls and filling up bottles. It's go, go, go when it's bottling time. So you're going to fill up the bottles, fill up the table, um, somebody, the next person putting those anti-tamper devices on. If it is not one of those 750s that is this size, uh, this will have a machine that will label it for us. Uh, and then everything else is going to be hand labeled right here. Uh, this is a gin bottle, but it'll be put on here. You put the front label on. You rotate it over, put the back label on. Uh, so by hand, uh, it's going to be one, if not all of us, has touched every bottle in some way. Uh, we take a lot of pride in it because being that there's only five of us, we all do everything. So we all have a kind of a keen insight into saying, you know, I bottle, I label, distill, mash, ferment, you know, give tours, give tastings. We're all doing something to help each other out. Um, so... Whereas other plants are so big, you know, somebody's entire shift might just be bottling or in the, the front room. Here, you know, you, <laughs> you could be carrying some grain upstairs with us uh, uh, or something like that. So everybody gets to have some sort of uh, combined experience on that, which is one thing that I take a lot of pride in, being that I'm involved in the first drop of water to when I hand it over to you at every step of the way from top to bottom, those barrels being filled, those barrels being dumped to being bottled, labeled, everything. At some point, I've touched that process to hand it over to somebody across the counter. Briefly mention your water. Is it just city water? It's, uh, so all of Kentucky sits on limestone reserve. All Kentucky water is limestone. Uh, we get it from Stoner Creek, which is city water. And so all of that uh, process is done through them. It's just simpler for us rather than having to go uh, and do... Uh, another process. It, it's all done osmosis, reverse osmosis already through the city. So here's our still. This is a 500 gallon hybrid reflex column pot still. Pot still on the bottom with a column on top. So what's going to happen is uh, the ferments from upstairs that we looked at are going to come down into here. We're going to fill it up. It's going to give us X amount of however much that we made. Whatever it is to get to 500, we're going to just top off with water. Um, it's usually just going to be a few gallons on top of that. And what we're going to do from there is turn on our boiler system. Boiler's going to shoot hot steam across. You can see it coming out of that little room across and then down here to the arm behind it. That hot steam is going to heat up the pot still. And that pot still is then going to start getting to 190 degrees, releasing the alcohol vapor. Alcohol vapor is going to travel up through the sight glasses. So if you've ever been to any other distillery or seen other ones, the taller the column is, the more alcohol that you're producing. But it's stripping natural flavor as that vapor travels up. So we have a hybrid by being a uh, pot still with a column on top. That column is going to give us a little bit extra bump in our overall yield 
but we're still maintaining a quality spirit right off our still. Something that we're very proud of. So that top hat portion, uh, I call well, I call it the top hat portion, but it is called a deflamator. It's a cold water cap. Uh, it's a Scottish word, and it's spelled deflegamator. Uh, so if you ever see it spelled, it's pretty funny. Uh, but the cold water cap. We'll say that again. German deflegmator. Deflegmator. That's a good one to know. I'm going to lock that one in. Uh, so cold water being pushed down reflux think uh, um, acid reflux in your stomach it is bubbling toiling away here of the wart and the mash that's going uh, so it's bubbling and we want it to bubble up into the column and heat up and spout into there it causing it to scorch so cold water gets pushed down and that keeps it from bubbling up and over the alcohol being lighter is going to travel up across the jacket arm and then down here. So this area right here is the cooling condenser. This is just cold water being flushed around inside of here. So what's going to happen? Hillbilly Stills. Yeah. Where are they out of, Tyler? Hillbilly Stills? Murray? Murray, Kentucky, Hillbilly Stills. Um, so they made this entire setup for us. Uh, very thankful for that. but. What's gonna happen here is, uh, think hot front meets cold front, like a rainstorm. That vapor is turning back into a liquid right here, and it's just gonna flow from the parrot right here. So it's a vapor back into a liquid from the cold water, and it's just gonna flow up and over. We're gonna use a hydrometer inside of there, which is gonna measure the alcohol content being created, and we separate heads, hearts, and tails. Heads, first bit of alcohol that comes off, if you don't know, not usable, not drinkable, we use it for cleaning out all the hoses and pipes that you've seen along the way. It's gonna be over 160 proof generally, uh, but we're gonna run it uh, from heads. It's gonna get roughly about a gallon to two gallons, uh, somewhere between here uh, is where we're gonna run it. And we're just looking for flavor change. Uh, we wanna kind of start dabbing on it uh, off the parrot to see when it starts turning to what I call a peanut butter sandwich. You're getting that nuttiness, you're getting that yeastiness. Uh, that's a good flavor uh, that you wanna get. So I'm gonna run it from there. When it gets below 160, so legally it can't come off the still, higher than 160 to be bourbon. So when it gets below 160 or 160 and below, when it starts tasting good, generally around the 145, 150 mark, that's when we'll cut to hearts. Hearts is our overall production run. This is what's gonna end up in a barrel. and we're gonna run that to 117 proof. So once it hits 117 overall batch, we cut to tails. Tails is the last bit of alcohol being squeezed out. I affectionately call it a supercharged white claw. It's in there between 60 and 80 proof. It's water, it's oil, it's floral. It's still alcohol, but it's not a flavor that we want to affect our overall hearts run. So we'll take that hearts run anywhere between 35 to 45 gallons. Uh, is generally where we live. We've gotten more, we've gotten less. Great days is more than 45, bad days is below 35. Um, so uh, we're gonna get uh, somewhere inside of there. We'll take it and we'll put it in a tote. Um, so we've got uh, 3065 over there that it can go in. Or if you take a look over here, Tyler's actually barreling uh, our run. So, <clears throat> pardon me. So we'll take that. If we do the same mash bill, say in a month, uh, that's what we'll, uh, we'll do for that whole month. And we'll take at the end, look at how many gallons we've created. So if we do three days a week of running uh, for a whole month, and I'm making this number up, but say we get like 185 gallons, we see from there, okay, how many 53s do we wanna do versus how many six gallons do we wanna do all 53s, whatever, uh, whatever it's gonna be. So that's the hearts runs and then the tails we're gonna take and redistill. So that's all of our tails right there uh, collected. We'll redistill it and we turn it into uh, a experimental moonshine okay. right now. So uh, we've got over there uh, in that tote 3065 uh, on the floor. That one has uh, our experimental moonshine. It's like 152 proof. So this is our experimental barrel. Uh, this came out of France. It is an open end head and back bung. So this is clear. When this was filled May 2nd of this year, uh, it went in clear. It was a, a clear white whiskey that went in, and this is taking on the natural color. So we call this our active aging barrel. We wanna see when color starts happening. When we filled this, it was in three days, it took on a, a, a light tinge yellow, uh, and then it started turning into a honey color. 
After about a month, it maintained this really nice dark honey. Uh, and then after about a month and a half, it turned into this amber color and kept getting darker. So up until about four weeks ago, you could still see through this. Now I'm gonna step around behind the back and you can't really see anything through it. I'm waving at you. Um, so you can kind of see, closer you are to it, you might be able to. That's a good opener for it. Yeah, almost. And so we just filled this up. It's not anything we're necessarily gonna be selling or sampling out of. It's mostly of when you come here and take a tour with us, this is gonna be changing. So we wanna see when evaporation loss starts happening. We wanna see color change. We wanna see all that. Every year we'll be pulling a sample, um, ideally just to see how it's aging next to a standard barrel. Um, so that's what we're gonna be doing. So it's just kind of a fun one-off thing that I think we're the only, I'm not saying we are the only ones, but right now, I think we're the only one. So it might be something cool that, that we start and other people might be doing. So you can always just kind of see kind of how the different reaction that happens inside of there. But this is a charred barrel. It's the, a normal barrel aside from the head and uh, back bung being off of it. So it's lost 25% roughly surface area of aging. So we don't know what this is gonna do open, being exposed to light or anything like that. But it's more so just a fun thing that you can come in and take a look at. Excellent. Yes. Okay. So we're going to roll down the line. Mm -hmm. Each one of these lines up with what you're about to have. Make sure, Make sure you're rolling. Picture. You know, hard filled in rum, it works as a tripod too. <laughs> uh, so we'll get started uh, right here. Uh, we're going to do white whiskey. So our white whiskey is 62% corn, 19% rye, 19% malted okay. barley. Would be the same as this. Exactly yeah. right. Okay. So this is what comes right off our still. Yeah. This is what other places are going to call white dog, white lightning, moonshine, something gimmicky like that. Most places will tell you, hey, it's not very good. We just want to show you what our high wine tastes like, whatever it is that they're going to be calling it. This is, in our opinion, how booze was made 100 years ago. It's kind of from not necessarily a specific recipe that we found, but just kind of something neat uh, that uh, 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 we looked into and kind of researched and found some things. I gotta, if you wanna. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so we uh, uh, researched and found some things. So this is how white whiskey was whiskey hundreds of years ago, how the regular person was drinking off of it because nobody was really aging if you were a blue collar person running off your still. So 100 proof, 62 corn. 19% rye, 19% malted barley. Mm -hmm. Corn sweetness yep. over the tongue, little rye spice that kind of sits on the edge, and then back to more corn sweetness. Uh, we kind of stand by it. We think this is great on its own. Yeah. My favorite way to do this is I'm gonna, I'm gonna drink it with lemonade, yeah. okay. mix it with something already kind of sweet, and it, and it mixes really well. Or ginger ale or Ginger ale's like great too. My favorite, sweet tea and lemonade. Okay. So uh, that's What's what I'm- cost? $20. That's great. Yeah. Okay. So um, we had a little bit of from the white dog from um, Buffalo Drake's. Mm -hmm. $58 yeah. for, for this bottle yeah. in Europe. It's yeah. Just like, it's, it's, it's also $20 in the figure yeah. as well, but it's just by the time yeah. it goes through yeah. seven different people. <laughs> All of the like, customs. Oh, All of it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and Fair so. Enough, yeah. So for us, we just wanted to have a quality spirit right off our still. We want those grains to taste. We don't want to distill those flavors mm -hmm. out. We want to maintain that, that uh, corn so, forward yeah. uh, sweetness. So okay. that's what we do right off the still. We run it to that 117 proof, proof it down to 100. And then what we're gonna do is put it in a barrel for 12 months mm -hmm. and age it. So that barrel is gonna be a six gallon barrel that you've seen upstairs aging. Uh, same mash bill, 62 corn, 19 rye, 19% 19 malted barley. That's two years? This is 12 months. 12 months. 12 months. Okay, that, that's, uh, that's so amazing what you did 12 months with that little barrel. And you said the wood is from Minnesota? Exactly right. Okay. Avon, Minnesota out of the barrel mill. All right. Yeah, the, the, the grain is much, much tighter up yep. there than it is yep. Kentucky. So that makes yeah. our Missouri or wherever you yeah. need your wood. When they pull them, uh, it's actually, they'll pull them from the colder climate. Right. And so pulling it then, it actually retains more sugar inside oh. of the oak. Okay. Uh, particularly the sap up there and the winters will stay a lot tighter up yeah. there. So there's even more of like a nice mellower sweetness that can kind of come out. And this retails are here? Fifty dollars. Right out of the door. Yeah. Yeah. Fifty-three with tax. Okay. It's yours. Cool. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Taking it overseas might be a little tough <laughs> for it. Something else, that's yeah. Not a problem, but yeah. yeah. Okay. 
number three is our weeded pre-prohibition bourbon, 80% corn, 20% malted wheat. So we foregone malted barley uh, to add in a malted wheat. This is gonna give a more unique flavor profile. So with most weeded, you're gonna get more citrusy caramel notes out of it. I get baking spice notes off of this one. Yeah. Off of the nose, it's very like fall sweetness, uh, cinnamon, baking spice notes. A little bit of uh, marshmallow vanilla with a little bit of uh, uh, like campfire smoke. So that oak takes on from a smokiness, it takes on like a campfire smokiness with a little bit of marshmallow in there. Did you get enough enzymes from the malted wheat? Yep. Wow, yeah. I did not expect that. Yeah, well, I, didn't, I didn't either. When I when I first did this mash bill, was I was like 70, 30, or what was 80, 80, 80, 20. 20. 20 percent malted wheat. Malted wheat doesn't have that much. All right, well, okay. Yeah, Very and that's that's a big help from uh, uh, South Fork, yeah. RT Case okay, at South right. Fork. Um, he's he's knowing what he's doing. Barrels? Six okay. gallon barrels okay, for 12 months. Yep. 12 months as well. Yep, 100 proof. So is, these two are yeah. 100 proof. This is my favorite winter time. Yeah. So I can imagine getting pretty chilly over there in Germany. Mm -hmm. This is what I'd reach yeah. for if I was over there. Tailgating for a soccer game, okay. if you guys do that. <laughs> Here, football's a big thing. Yeah. This is my fall time, you know, uh, yeah. this is what I reach for. Definitely a little bit of that, more of a caramel moment here. Ooh, like that. Also 50 or more? 50, yep, so okay. 20, 50, 50, 50. Yeah. 50. And then last one, Old Bourbon County. This is our modern mash bill. Modern mash bill is going to be uh, 72 corn, 20% wheat, 8% malted okay. barley, but it's going to be in the 53 gallon barrels aged for a minimum of four years. With this, we do six barrel pulls at a time. Five barrels are going to be put into the batch and then one barrel is going to be picked out to be the single barrel left at cash strength. We do this to 110 proof for the overall batch blend. And we wanted a bottle that uh, you can see here represents Kentucky. Yeah. Take a look at it and you can say, oh, that's probably what Kentucky looks like. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very good. That was actually the picture of the guy here. That yep. Was, yeah, yep. From up there. there. Yep. That was just a blown up yeah. version of it. Uh, this one's my favorite, uh, my go-to for sipping neat. Mm. Uh, I go to this one. I might do a couple drops of water in it. Even, heck, putting an ice cube in it at 110 proof, you've got a lot of body for it to play around with uh, and kind of allow flavors to bloom uh, coming off of it. So, you said you had some barrels there. They're going to be for the ninth or 10th year anniversary. There, yeah, 10th so. year anniversary. Those are older mash bills. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I don't know what they are. I haven't asked them. Uh, when and they brought them out. More or less four years of age, are you going to go up For five? 53s, right now five, we're doing six, four seven. years. Okay. When we can up our production, right. we want to add more time onto that. But <laughs> where we're in bourbon world, as, you, as you're as you aware, we want to hit that four year mark to put product out. Mm -hmm. But we want to get to the point where we're making money off the product to buy more grains, right. to make more stuff, yeah. so that then we can set stuff back and get more, uh, get more and more onto it. But right now, the four years is a sweet spot for us. Mm -hmm. We want to set at least one barrel back to get, you know, maybe six years on, see yep. if that's yep. a viable option and find that, you know, the five, the six, the eight year on that barrel to see what it's going to be doing. Oh, it's a single barrel. For yeah, see, exactly on. right. Okay. I think the wheat did is actually my favorite. Of I, I love all of this stuff. You know, it's when I first started here, just in my interview process, I bought a bottle of this just to yeah. take home. I was like, maybe it'll look good when I interview. I know I kind of already know the boss man, but you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna take take it home and I drank it down right to the 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 top of the line because I was like, this is really good. Because you know, you don't want to work at a place that you're like, is this gonna be good? Like, how do I talk about this stuff and be like, it's a really good four year old bourbon? You know, trust me, I really do believe in our product. I think it's good. The batch that I've made is going to be ready in three and a half so years or a little less. So I'm excited about my old Bourbon County stuff. Uh, this stuff that I've made, this is uh, next batch is the stuff that I've made. So it's it's something I take pride in that I'm I'm saying this is what I've made. I'm handing over to you uh, along with Tyler. Me and him are distilling and making the stuff. So uh, being that there's only five of us, like I said, you know we're we're all doing everything. But we're uh, sixty five dollars. Okay. It's 68 50, out the door, yeah, I believe. Yeah, okay. So we try to stay in a affordable range uh, in terms of the other crafts. We're kind of in the lower end yeah. on our prices, but it allows more people to buy our stuff. Yeah, you know, we want to. We don't want to charge so much uh, that we almost price ourselves into oblivion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to be able to maintain. You know, get it out there, 
and people to look at it and be like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe I will pick this up. So the Hartfield name, the distillery that we are, it dates back to Jeremy Buchanan's grandfather's grandfather, I believe, great grandfather, somewhere in the time of 1860 in Greene County, Kentucky. And so this was a sketch of the original uh, Hartfield distillery in Greene County, Kentucky. Uh, we were not able to get the uh, same uh, distillery number as them. Things were different back then, but we revitalized it in its own current uh, DSP that we have today. Uh, but it's just something cool that we do have a connection that this original distillery was started by our current owner's uh, uh, ancestor, and it was Isaac and Leopold Hartfield who started it. And from what we found, uh, I believe Isaac was the uh, like tinsmith and coppersmith and Leopold was the grain and distiller for it. So something kind of cool, neat little history that we have uh, as a piece of connection to the old ways of making things as well. So our Franken whiskey is typically what does not fit into a barrel and we'll just blend it together. Yep. So it could be, uh, you know, a half gallon of our weeded, two gallons of our uh, bourbon whiskey rye, Whatever, if we're making something and it doesn't fit into a barrel, we're gonna blend them together. This one's pretty unique because it's five barrels of seven different mash bills. So it has some of our experimental grain in mixed barrels. It has a couple of old Bourbon County barrels and a couple of our uh, pre-prohibition bourbon whiskey barrels in them. Uh, and so what we did was created this blend, but one of the offshoot barrels that's inside of it is our uh, moonshine that I mentioned, all the tails redistilled. The tails have like two gallons of gin inside of it that's redistilled, giving it a super unique, yeah. weird lifting green tea-like flavor note to it. So if you wanna just smell it or if you even wanna taste it, a yeah, I'll let, you, I'll let you try it. So the first little bit is gonna have this herbally green tea note to it, and then the back end's gonna start tasting like whiskey. It's, it's weird. It's unique. It's something that we do every October 31st. We're going to release a different one, uh, and it's going to possibly, most likely, be different than the last one. We're constantly just changing and putting stuff in there. If you want to get a close-up on this bottle, this was done by uh, Tony Moore, who is the guy who did the Walking Dead comic books. He drew them, and he did some of Marvel stuff uh, as a, a comic drawer for them, and uh, he partnered with us. We partnered with him. Uh, and he did this label for us. So something kind of cool and unique, a one-off thing that you can only get inside of our distillery right now that uh, when people come in, it's a great talking point to have on your shelf. Something unique. Yeah, so uh, when you come in, you'll roll right over here and you can look at all of our offerings. Uh, we've got our uh, pre-prohibition line right here. So this is our bourbon whiskey that's number two on the flight that you had. Here's number three on the flight, our weeded bourbon. Our exceptional barrel is going to be the single barrel based off of whatever pre-prohibition line that we have out. So this happens to be our weeded one. It's gonna be at cash strength. This is 114.5 proof. So it's just one of those six gallon barrels pulled, left at cash strength, watch behind you. Uh, and then uh, we've got our experimental line that we'll do, our white whiskey, the Franken whiskey. This bourbon whiskey is just a 375 based off of uh, our pre-prohibition flight. We, of course, got to have an entire shelf to our uh, awesome Old Bourbon County recipe. Uh, beautiful bottle. Our white label is going to be the single barrel, and our blue is going to be our batch. So this is 120 proof for our single barrel, and our uh, batch overall is 110. Uh, we've got over here, here's our commemorative, our first barrel box. So it's gonna come in one of these commemorative oak boxes. And inside of that is gonna be our first single barrel of Old Bourbon County that we laid down. It's gonna have a commemorative bung and a cool rocks glass that comes with it. We've got maple syrup, gin, and then our whiskey. So it's the same mash bill as uh, number two on the flight, our Kentucky bourbon whiskey, but we just put in in a used barrel, a very kind of unique cherry cola flavor that comes off of it. Then we have our white rums and our aged rum. And then this Wild Wolf is a contract run that we do for a guy named Ron Blair. Uh, Ron Wolford Blair wrote a book about his ancestor who was Colonel Frank Wolford. And he was uh, uh, in the Civil War, the American Civil War. He was a Union general. He did the research on him, wanted to uh, uh, do a book 
he wrote the book on it and wanted a bourbon to be paired with his book. Yeah. And then, of course, we've got all of our glassware right here. Things, coffee beans that are aged, um, some cool Bourbon County books, our hats and other, other items that you can come in and purchase. Okay, very good. What can we find you online? Hartfield and Company. Um, we've got a, a, a little thing over here you can get a, a, a better close-up on. But here, Hartfield and Company, www. If you search Hartfield and Co. Uh, on Google, that'll pop up. It's going to give you all the information. We do tours every hour on the hour. Um, Tuesday to Saturday, we are open 9 to 5. Uh, so 4 o'clock is going to be the last tour time that you can hop in there. We do tastings at any point during the day. Walk-ins are welcome. Hop on in. And we'd like to have you already on a tasting or something within the five minutes of you being there. Uh, but if you show up for a tour, you can come in 10 minutes beforehand and you'll get hopping on that next hour tour. And then Mondays, we're open one to five, uh, one being the first time for tours. There's a, a lot less people working on Monday. Uh, but come on in. We just we want to have you and come experience bourbon from Bourbon County. Thank you very much.